Normally, I hate being negative about movies, especially horror movies. We have a lot of that going on in the community, and I like to be a hype girl or at least see the positive, even though some things suck. Of course, there's rant in between. I'm not saying I don't rant a lot because I definitely do, but a few years ago, I did a shit list video, and ever since, people have been asking. So, <laughs> I am back today and we're going to talk about some of my biggest disappointments of the year. Because I'm a little bit of a Grinch this year, going through quite a bit, I thought it might be a bit cathartic to just let it, let it go. There's light spoilers on this because I'm going to point out some things I didn't like. I'm not going to go into any twists or anything like that, uh, but if you do want to skip around, I've left them all time coded. And obviously, this is my own opinion. This is my channel, so it's my own opinion. And it's totally my own expectations and we have to be transparent. You all know I love going into movies completely blind, so a lot of these are my own fault because my expectations were skewed. If I had only watched the trailer, maybe I would have thought otherwise, but we'll get into all of that. Let's start with Insidious. The Red Door. In this entry to the franchise, the Lamberts must go deeper into the further, deeper than ever before, to put their demons to rest for once and for all. When you hear that blurb, you think, wow, what are they, what are they gonna do in this movie? The answer, not, not a lot. The reason my expectations were quite high for this one is I know that the last key wasn't anyone's real favorite, but it did have some iconic demonic <laughs> entities. And I was a huge fan of the third one in the series that takes place in that kind of apartment building. And so I had hope for additions to this franchise and I am an Insidious girly. I prefer Insidious over Conjuring. So I was very interested to see what they were gonna do. But it's not just that, the movie really did hype itself up. Not only did it bring back the original cast from 13 years ago, including the little boy, which is insane, it also was Patrick Wilson's directorial debut. So there was a lot riding on it. And you know what, it started off fine, but then it just trickled out and it was kind of a depressing movie, which it is horror, I get that, but I found it to be a very blasé entry when it brought back all of the history that they've gone over the whole franchise. So it was a revisiting with the same cast, which is really rare. And then they kind of just made it a very simple storyline. It was a strange way to end. I mean, we never know if it's over, but a way to end that family story after all we've been through with them. And it, it disappointed me. I love Patrick Wilson. And Lin Shay's involvement. Come on, Lin Shay carried those films, especially the first film. She carried that on her back. And I'm not even the biggest Lin Shay fan, but she did amazing work uh, for this series. And I recapped the whole thing. I watched all of the films before watching this one just to get it all back in my head and fresh. And I just can't believe how much of a shining star she was throughout the whole franchise. And then she was just left. Well, you know what she did with her character if you've seen it. <laughs> it's okay, but it's, it's Lin Shay. Have some respect, man. The next one is a little bit controversial. It is Five Nights at Freddy's. And if you don't think that's controversial, you honestly have not been in the fandom because it's terrifying out here. People are very gatekeepery, toxic fandom about this whole franchise and the lore. And what I didn't know about the film, even though I had done my research on the lore, is it's based mostly on the lore, which breaks away from the traditional lore. <laughs> it's mainly based on the lore from the books, but it, then it also has its own twist on the lore. Of course, Five Nights at Freddy's is about a troubled security guard who begins to work at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, and during his first night on the job, he realizes that the night shift won't be so easy to get through. This film is really interesting because part of it is made just for the fans, where if you didn't know any of the entities, you wouldn't understand what was happening. Like if I didn't know who Spring Trap was, that reveal would just be nothing to me. It's just an odd standalone film from the perspective of a, just a horror movie watcher. But if you're into the lore, I've heard people either love it or hate it. But the thing that really got me was, I feel like even though Five Nights at Freddy's is a very dark and gloomy story, the world it's wrapped up in, it's also quite campy. And I had a lot of people disagree with me, but things like Baby Circus and, and just how wild it all seems, especially the staff bots, it's so strange to go from that kind of story into just the gloomy elements which is more of the traditional video game law. So all of the laws are clashing, which is totally fine. But the thing that got me was that the entities weren't even scary. And I thought if they were gonna take it down the dread and gloomy avenue, 
It would make sense if they kept, you know, Chica and Foxy as terrifying jump scares that just jumped out and they were just evil and they went against this. It was such a weird direct focus that this film had and it it was a disappointment for me because I thought at the end of the day at least I'd get some insane jump scares and I just didn't get enough from the, I don't know if you want to call them entities, mascots, <laughs> animatronics, not as much as what I hoped I would get. Even if they wanted to do whatever they did with the lore, I wanted it to be at least scary. And it was scary, but in a very different kind of just dread stirring atmosphere kind of way. I do appreciate the atmosphere, but it was a lot. They bit off a lot more than they could chew with that one. Next, something that I think most of us can agree on is Pet Cemetery Bloodlines. I had lowered my expectations when I found out that this is kind of a prequel to the 2019 remake. This one is set in 1969 where we follow a young Judd Crandall and his childhood friends who band together to confront an ancient evil that has taken a hold over their hometown of Ludlow. The thing is this film changes everything about Judd's character that we know, especially from the book. I know it's not meant to exactly blend into the book in the original film or anything like that, just the remake, but it's all based on that source material. And it changed just so many ideas and it had so many inconsistencies with Judd's story, with his core story and how he found out about the Pet cemetery. It changed everything. And people are even saying the timelines for his age are completely off. It just didn't even feel like Judd's story. It should have just been someone else's story who lived in the same town. And then we get to the flashbacks. So why would you make a film, <laughs> I'm trying not to rant, but why would you make a film that is a prequel to give you the, you know, the roots? That's what I love about prequels. I was all about this prequel when I heard about it because I love getting to the roots of a story you know, like Pennywise, I would love a prequel where I know we're going to do something like that TV show, but I would love to get to, you know, the roots of where he came from, how things developed, how it happened. That's what prequels are all about for me. And to have a prequel that is about Judd and then not even to explain really anything is bizarre to me. Sure, we see Judd's first realization with the Pet Cemetery, which is completely different to stories we knew about him prior, but we don't learn about the Pet Cemetery th itself. Instead, we go back in time and then we get flashbacks from there that show still the grounds as they kind of are today. We're getting flashbacks in a prequel that don't even go back to the, the root of the story or the inception of the area, which what is the point? I don't, I just don't see the point. Bloodlines, okay, I guess it's about Judd, but then they screw Judd's story up. So it just felt like there was nothing in that film, really for anybody, no interesting information added. The film was beautiful by the way, but just completely boring, <laughs> sorry. Okay, this next one is a huge disappointment for me. I was just really excited for Dear David. Dear David was an original ARG story that Adam Ellis, who worked for Buzzfeed, wrote up on Twitter. Basically, it was a story about a haunted ghost in his room that had a smashed in head and this viral thread just unraveled where everyone was on the edge of their seat trying to learn about the story of David. And so they turned it into a movie. And a lot of people's feedback for this was they shouldn't have trust a BuzzFeed movie. I can agree with that, but more so why a BuzzFeed horror movie? The film was not a horror movie. It was a horror movie, but it wasn't. Everything in this film is completely careless, starting with the blurb, which on IMDb is, a man is haunted by the ghost of a boy named David who is trying to kill him. <laughs> what? what? How enticing. Look, I understand why the rights were given to Buzzfeed, but they really should have consulted some production companies that worked more so with horror. Basically, they got rid of all of the amazing details that makes the story scary, all of the simplicity. I mean, it was a Twitter thread. All of the simplicity is gone. And then they cut out anything that is actually scary to the story and make it more about the main character and their character arc instead of the David, the boy itself. Also with the stylization, because it's Buzzfeed, they gave it this kind of like pop kind of feel instead of a really raw structure where this could have been a found footage, a really low budget found footage, and it could have worked pretty well because that's the whole point 
It's meant to be a raw piece of material. It was so sinister and they completely cut that from the story. And any parts that they had that were meant to be horrific moments, they would do flashbacks in this it's almost felt like an alternate reality to give the story of what actually happened to the boy. It was unbelievable or just not realistic, which I guess it is hard to do a realistic story about this, but they really just gave no care. If anything, they just spent too much time on the lead story and it sucked all of the actual ghost story out of this film. This film that people had waited so long to watch. Okay, here's one that you may not have seen, Concentration. I feel like religious horror movies, we need to press the snooze button. Okay, we're, we're doing too much and it's getting t a little bit too wild. We need to just let the nuns sit down, have a break. We just need to give them a little bit of time before we keep rushing back. We had the Pope's Exorcist and the Nun 2 this year. And you know what? Those ones I'm not too disappointed by because they kind of were exactly as I expected. But this film, picture this blurb starring Jenna Malone as Grace. After her priest brother unalives himself, she travels to a remote Scottish convent where he fell to his death. Soon she begins to poke holes in the church's account, which leads her to the dark truth. I love Jenna. And I was expecting this rich history about this convent and, you know, dark underbelly of society, all that good stuff, you know, nuns scurrying in the darkness, all the good stuff. I wasn't expecting too much, I thought. And you know what? I got that. The visuals for this film are phenomenal, beautiful, but <laughs> the story doesn't match it at all. The story turns into more of a thriller kind of mystery, maybe even just like a mystery drama, and it's missing any horrific elements and it ties everything back to a different source. The visuals were doing the most, yet the story itself doesn't even measure up and it feels really lazy and predictable while the visuals are, are selling you a completely mismatched journey. It ended up being this completely convoluted story that you really have to jump through, you know, do mental gymnastics, jumping through hoops to believe while it delivered in such a beautiful location. So that's what really disappointed me about the film. Just nothing came together at all. Some of the visuals were horrific, but the story is rooted in murder and mystery and it doesn't really blend together well. Next up, Malum. You know, when I heard that they were remaking last year from 2014, I was so excited. I love this indie film. I think it's terrifying. I was so scared when I first watched this one. I can remember where I was when I first saw this film and I just thought it was a terrifically crafted indie film. So when I found out the, the same creators were going to recreate this film with a bigger budget or putting some more kind of bells and whistles on the story, I could not wait to see what was gonna come out. And what came out was, <laughs> it wasn't as good, let's just say that. The movie is about a newly recruited police officer who is ordered to take the last shift at a police office that is closing down. But while she thinks she is alone in the building, this is not the case. The film has no atmosphere. They tried to shove all of this extra information and background story into the main character's journey that just didn't bring anything extra to the story. The story at its core worked well because it was such a simple premise taking place in one building and they added all of this extra information before and after to the film that padded it out and I think just took away from the terror of you know, just being alone in an abandoned building that you find out is kind of haunted. And the haunting story, trust me, that is not a spoiler because it goes quite deep. And I like that you didn't know too much about her in the original film. It all came together as such a unique surprise. And I felt like in this film, they tried so hard to make it poetic that they lost any of that special terror that was connected to the original. Also, the visuals. They're not as good at all. They're in fact kind of carbon copies and with the bigger budget or, you know, putting more time and care into it, it's it's literally a copy and paste. It's not even a great one. I did a Patreon review, I believe, or a Patreon side-by-side um, -side watch for this one. And I couldn't believe how the visuals of the original were so much better, This all the scary aspects. I'm not going to show you. I'll show you one. I just didn't want to show you too much because, spoilers, but... Honestly, the original is so good for an indie film. I would highly recommend checking that out, but this was such a disappointment, especially because they had such a good thing going and I wish that they had taken that money 
and turned it into a different film altogether than recreating something that worked fine the first time. And then the last film that I need to talk about, <sighs> I went through a journey this year and that included watching all 10 at the time, Children of the Corn films. But in 2020, during lockdown, there was another storm brewing. <laughs> it was a new remake of Children of the Corn and it only got released this year. Before I get into this, I was rooting for you. Children of the Corn has never had a good film and I will stand by that. Even the original, you go back, rewatch it, even though Malachi and Isaac, they're just adorable little creatures of subculture. They are not the entities we dream them up to be, but I love the film. As, as bad as it is, I do like the films. And obviously justice for Eli from Urban Harvest because Eli is everything. But I was thinking, you know what? Maybe, maybe this will be the year. Maybe we'll finally get just a solid, I'm not saying great, just a solid Children of the Corn film, and this one did not deliver. So this is yet again another revision on the classic story about a small town that deal with a killer child cult who kill all of the adults in their village. The film did have a certain twist on it that made it a little bit more modern, uh, bringing in environmental factors and giving reasonings, but the script, the dialogue, the characters, nothing in this film delivered and it just it just makes me disappoint. Disappointed is the only word I can come up with. I am defeated by this series. I would love before I die on my deathbed to know that there was a good Children of the Corn film because the source material is so particular and so sinister and nothing has been able to capture it. And I honestly thought, hey, we're in 2023 now. Surely we can come up with some cool special effects that would be able to encapsulate what he who walked behind the rose is and really bring some sinister feel to it. But no, not today, not ever, maybe. Children of the Corn for me was one of the most disappointing films of the year because I just had not high expectations on this film, but a lot of pressure on this film for me. But I wanna know what your biggest disappointments of the year were. What were the films that you were so excited to see and they just didn't live up to the hype or the hype that you created in your own mind? But if you wanna spin the wheel and try out something fresh, I have a bunch of new Christmas horror movies that you may have not seen. All listed up here, they're all available on streaming or VOD. And then also other horror movies, new horror movies that are available on VOD this month. That's video on demand or streaming platforms. Check them out and I'll talk to you all very soon. Stay safe and stay spooky. Bye friends.